Hello there and welcome to The Meaningful Stitch. This is episode 45 and I am Amy Palco and I'm coming to you from Edinburgh, Scotland and this is the place where I like to share my knitting practice and my knitting projects. Now I don't have quite as much to share with you as I did last time because that was a bit of a bumper episode. I think I spoke for about two hours and then there was 20 minutes of footage from our trip to Budapest. So if you have a couple of hours to spare <laughs> and uh, you would like some knitting company, then you can go and check that previous episode out. This one will be quite a bit shorter. Like I said, I've got less to share and I also don't have any footage at the end of this episode. I am going to North East Wool Fest this weekend down in Newcastle and so I'm hoping to have some footage for the next episode but I don't quite have any for this and that's fine. It's the summertime. <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let things be easy. <laughs> so if you are new here, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for checking me out and if you are returning, well you will get, you will already know that all the show notes are available in the description box below and there will be a link there to a Patreon page which is free to access for everybody and includes photographs which obviously I can't put in the description box but uh, but yes you'll be able to see photographs maybe even some extra links and things will be available there I'm very constricted by the character limit in the description box and um, my show notes tend to be quite long <laughs> And involved uh, so I like to have the space that the, that the Patreon page provides me so you can access all of that and obviously if you want to support the channel you can also do that by signing up to my Patreon there's also a Ko-Fi link and the other thing that's in the mailing is uh, that's in the description box is the mailing address and I have some lovely things that have been mailed to me recently that I'm going to be sharing with you just shortly so before we get into all of that, I'm going to share with you a card that I have drawn from one of my Oracle decks. Now, I say this every time, or most times really, is that these cards are not intended to tell the future. They're not about fortune telling. Uh, these are very much about providing a perspective, about creating a way for seeing. And I use them specifically for exploring my creativity and my making. So the card that I've chosen this time is from the Animal Spirit deck by Kim Kranz. It's one of the Wild Unknown Oracle decks. And the card that I drew for us for today is this one, Cobra. And I'm just gonna to read to you the words from the guidebook. Cobra, pausing, waiting, the inner teacher. The Cobra represents a teacher or spiritual guardian. The Cobra hovers and watches ever present, ever protecting, ever loving. The essence of the cobra is found deep within us in the form of the inner teacher and manifests externally in those special guides who've led us along our path. What would it feel like to be a student again? What are you ready to learn? Remember the old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Now, I think that's a really interesting card particularly for me because I'm coming up for a period of learning a little later this month because I'm going to be attending the Faculty of Astrology Summer School which will be down in Oxford in just a couple of weeks time. So I'm very excited about that and I'm hoping to find some new teachers there. This student is most definitely ready. <laughs> but the other thing I was thinking about was you know, how our making really teaches us and how we engage with that. I've got a project that I'm going to be sharing with you just shortly, uh, which really kind of represents that for me because it showed it taught me a technique. Uh, the, the pattern taught me a technique that I had never used before. And it had been one that I'd really kind of shied away from and decided that it wasn't really for me. But actually, now that I've, had, now that I've given it a go, it was a lot easier than I expected it to be. And really it's opened up uh, it's really opened up the possibilities and opportunities within my own making. So I'm going to be sharing more about that just shortly. But you might want to have a bit of a think as well about what is it that you're ready to learn and how is your making teaching you right now? So there we go. That is our card. And then the next thing I want to share with you is our giveaway winner. Now, you might remember in the last episode, I shared that I had been to the Scottish Yarn Festival ticket launch party 
and I had picked up some lovely skeins, a project bag, some stitch markers and a patch, an embroidery patch and it was all going to go to uh, one winner uh, from randomly selected from the comments. So I have randomly selected a winner from the comments. Here it is. I'll just show you this and I'll pop it up as well. It's Helen Ravine. Hi. Hi, Helen. <laughs> you've won. <laughs> Let me show you what you've won. Oh my goodness, I'm like a game show host. <laughs> Let me show you what you've won, Helen. <laughs> we have this beautiful skein of Suri from Zakami. Um, we have this gorgeous skein of yarn here from Celia McWheelie. And this is a Merino Yak Silk DK. And then we have that embroidery patch that I just mentioned from the Scottish Yarn Festival. We have this really cute little mini skein. I think this is from Yarn Unique. And I have some stitch markers, which are Scottish Sea Glass. And I have these stitch markers as well. And these are Bobbles and Berries, and it's the Lunar Phases. And then I have this beautiful project bag here, which is Hodge Hegg Creations. Yes, Hodge Hegg Creations with these gorgeous puffins on it. And it's got a lovely little pocket on the inside as well. It's beautifully made. So there we go. That is what you have won, Helen. So if you, if you could please get in touch with me, you can send me a message through Instagram. Uh, I am Amy Palco on Instagram, or you can get in touch with me via my email, which is amypalco at googlemail.com, and I will pop that also in the description box below so you can contact me. As I mentioned, I will be going to another yarn festival this weekend, and I thought I would do something similar there. Um, I know that I am very privileged in being able to attend these wonderful festivals and then not everybody has access to them. So I really want to be able to take you along and share some of the, some of the lovely things that I find there. So, uh, so that's what I'm gonna try and do with the Newcastle, with the Northeast Wool Fest as well. Try and pick up a little, a few bits and pieces and then put together a prize package. But I'll be announcing that in the next episode. So in the meantime, well done, Helen. Uh, thank you so much for, for uh, contributing your comment. And uh, thank you to everybody who left the comments, actually, because they were really beautiful. I had asked uh, people to let me know what was on the needle, what was on their needles that was bringing them joy. How was their making bringing them joy? And I, gosh, I had almost, I had well over 500 comments, certainly. I think it almost had 600. And, uh, and yes, so there's lots of beautiful recommendations for patterns and uh, projects and yarn that people have been using and that was just lovely to read so thank you so much to everybody who left a comment and again congratulations to Helen. The next thing I want to share with you just before we get on to all of the knitting content and as you can tell there is some knitting content it is coming <laughs> is the cal that I'm running along with Jackie Rose of the Caddy Jacks Knits podcast and we are running the Scottish Shrug Club Cal in celebration of the Scottish Yarn Festival. So it goes until the Scottish Yarn Festival happens, which is the 9th and 10th of September. You're invited to knit one of Jackie's shrug patterns, which are all free and available on Ravelry. I'll include the link below. I have done a beautiful recording with interview with Jackie, where she shows us all of her shrugs and talks about the origins of the pattern and some of the different things that you can do with it. So a, a real opportunity for some inspiration there. So I'll be getting that up on this channel ASAP. <laughs> so watch out for that because that will be coming really soon. Uh, it's a wonderful, these are wonderful patterns. They're very, they're very fun and they're very adaptable. And they're a good way to use up some of those skeins that perhaps you purchased at a previous festival and you want to maybe use that up before you come to the next one. Uh, but what would be really lovely to see is if you are coming along to the Scottish Yarn Festival, it'd be lovely to see some, some shrugs in person. So, so yes, the Scottish Shrug Club Cal, and um, that's the hashtag that we're using over on Instagram. Uh, please do join in. 
So there we go. That is our giveaway. That's our cow. That's the show notes. That's our card. I think we're on to the knitting. <laughs> so what am I wearing? Well, now I shared this as a finished object last time, which was perhaps a little bit cheeky because it was not yet washed blocked with ends woven in. So it wasn't entirely a finished object but it is most definitely a finished object now and it's been worn a couple of times. So, <laughs> so this is the Thonin top. I will just scoot up a little bit so you can see it is a cropped top, crop top. No, it's definitely not a crop top. <laughs> My days of crop tops are most definitely over. <laughs> It is a cropped t-shirt so it just kind of comes to my natural waist. Uh, I have knitted it in this fabulous yarn which is from Ginger Twist Studio which is my local yarn shop and it is a mixture of DK weight yarn and this is Tweed Treat which is a, a merino, a DK merino and this gorgeous fluffy delightfulness which is Jessie's new base which is called Sweet Suri Lace. And both of them are in the colourway design of a decade, which is the new colourway that Jess brought out in celebration of Ginger Twist's 10th birthday. So this pattern, Thon and Top, is by Cat Weaver. And she also has a lovely podcast here on YouTube, which you should, which you should check out. And it was published in the Journal of Scottish Yarns. And I think that was issue three. Uh, the top looks a little bit different in those pages because I have, in fact, I think I've got it here. I do. Uh, mine looks a little bit different because uh, I made some modifications and some of those modifications were on purpose and some of them were by accident, which is fine. <laughs> here you go. This is, this is the two different versions that were given in the book, in the, in the journal. And you can see in both of them that they use the Suri lace for the sleeves. And mine does not. Mine has the DK for the sleeves. And basically I just modified the pattern by picking up the number of stitches that seemed appropriate for, for, the, for the number of stitches that I had when I split for sleeves. And then I improvised a series of decreases going down here because really actually there was quite a lot of um, circumference around this part. So I really wanted to decrease it down a bit. I'm not normally a fan of decreasing on short sleeves. Um, those who are long time viewers of The Meaningful Stitch may remember that I came a little bit unstuck with that in terms of my tenure by Caitlin Hunter. And I ended up with sleeves that were far too tight, unfortunately. Uh, and that really kind of puts me off wearing it. And so I didn't want that with this, but I did feel like I needed to, to do a little bit of tapering. So I just improvised those. I think I decreased two stitches every seven rows, approximately. And uh, the other thing to tell you is I used two skeins of the Tweed Treat. And I think I used one skein of the Suri Lace. And so when I got, and I did actually do helical knitting, which you can maybe, you can maybe see um, in the, in the body here. And I, I, don't, I don't know, I didn't do it in the top. I didn't do helical knitting in the yoke. I just did it in the body. And I only did that for as long as I needed to before one ball of my yarn ran out. And so then I just used the one. And I don't think you can really see particularly where, what, where that transition happened. And once I did that, I had well, I had one, maybe like half a ball of half a skein of the Tweed Treat. And so I divided it into two balls and I used that to knit as much of the sleeve as I possibly could. And I actually really like the length that that's given me. So those were intentional modifications, the helical knitting and the, and the um, sleeve length. The other intentional modification was that I have added eyelets into the into the lace into the yoke. Now again, I will show you the picture in the journal, and you will see. There we go. You will see that there aren't, aren't actually eyelets in the original, and so I've added eyelets into mine. Um, perhaps it gives I don't know just a little bit more aeration. <laughs> 
<laughs> if it's going to be a short top that I'm wearing in the in the well, ridiculously, I am actually wearing lace and I'm wearing Surrey and Merino in the summertime in Edinburgh because our August has not been that warm. Uh, so we it's definitely been an early onset of sweater weather. Maybe we will still have like a a return of some of the warmer weather, but we don't seem to have it right now. But anyway, uh, yes, so I do have the eyelets and that isn't in the pattern. So that was another intentional uh, uh, modification. But the unintentional modification was that for some reason I picked up the wrong needle size. So my gauge is off. Uh, so one of the most perhaps noticeable uh, modifications about this is that it fits me much closer to my body than I had originally intended, which is fine. <laughs> it's just it was just a bit surprising when I finally noticed what was what was going on, and that my gauge was off. I was using a smaller needle than I had intended to use, and uh, and I probably have maybe only about an inch or so of positive ease rather than the the positive ease that's recommended in the pattern. So I would absolutely knit this pattern again. It was a very enjoyable knit and I think it made a really lovely uh, use between the Suri and the and the DK. And so I would definitely do that again. And maybe I would modify it again by maybe not adding in the eyelets and knitting it uh, to, the, to the gauge that was intended. But anyway, that's what we ended up with. Uh, I will also say that I used the remainder of the skeins of Suri that I had in this colourway, Design of a Decade, in my second sample of my design, the Gallus Scarf, which will be coming out on the 9th of September, which coincides with the Scottish Yarn Festival. So there will be a little bit of a launch party at the designer's spotlight stall, the designer spotlight stall. <laughs> And uh, and yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. I've got a few preview knitters who are who are busy, busy working up their own gala scarves. Everybody is commenting on uh, how addictive the knit is and how enjoyable it is, and that's certainly how I find it too. This uh, this particular sample here is not knitted to gauge, and really, actually, that's you know the gauge is completely adaptable because it is a long scarf, so you can. <laughs> You can play with the gauge all you like. I have given gauge and measurements for um, and yardage and all of that kind of stuff in the pattern. Uh, there are some details still to be hashed out a little bit and I still need to record a tutorial to help you out with the cast on. But, uh, but yes, we're pretty much good to go with that. So I'm really excited uh, to, to be sharing this pattern with everybody. And I'm going to be picking up, I'm hopefully going to be picking up some DK weight yarn from Northeast Wool uh, to knit another sample in time for the Scottish Yarn Festival. So we'll see, we'll see if that happens. It should be, I think I can do that because uh, that's also going to include my, my train journey down to Oxford and a week's worth of classes and then a weekend in London and then returning on the train. So I do have train knitting and class time knitting and I think this kind of project would be completely perfect because it is all garter and it is the, the shaping, the, the diagonals are created with, with short rows. And then we have this beautiful finishing of the I-cord edging and cast on and cast off. So there we go. That's the Gallus scarf and I wore this when I went to see the double bill of Barbie and Oppenheimer and uh, I thought that was rather appropriate because as um, my friend Rebecca pointed out it was rather Barbenheimer so <laughs> so there we go that's the gala scarf and that will be coming out on the 9th of September which is really not very long to wait now at all so oh gosh so there we are this is the thon and top that was the gala scarf I only have one finished object, but it is a rather special one. Uh, I'm going to take this off and show you this beautiful finished object. Now this is 
This has basically been constantly on my body since I knitted it, <laughs> since I finished it. This is my Leith cardigan and it's a new pattern by Rebecca Klo of the Korea Bea podcast. And she has come up with this really fun design and it includes uh, intarsia down the back, which I will show you. Here we are. This is an intarsia seam down the back here. And you could, I mean, there's so many different options, but she does include options in the pattern of um, doing these kind of broader stripes or choosing skinny stripes or maybe choosing no stripes at all. In fact, she's just had a beautiful sample knitted that has skinny stripes on one side and on one sleeve and is plain on the other. And it looks amazing. And now I think I want another one. <laughs> so it's a worsted weight pattern. I'm going to put it back on just because I love it so. <laughs> it's a worsted weight pattern and uh, I don't generally knit with that weight of yarn if I'm completely honest and so I had a little bit of a rummage through my stash, more on this later, <laughs> and I realised that I could, I had enough to be able to uh, double up some fingering weight and add some lace weight to create a worsted weight garment. So that's what I did. So basically I held this yarn here, double, and I added in this yarn here, which is, so this is Holst Super Soft in the colorway Scarab. And Holst Super Soft is 50%, let me see if I can, 50% Merino, 50% Shetland. It does still have its spinning oil in it and excess dye, and so it really does need a very good wash. But it does mean also that it blooms really beautifully because it does look pretty skinny, pretty skinny scrawny yarn in the in the cone. But when you wash and block it, it blooms really beautifully and softens up a lot. And I held it with this yarn here. And this is also Holst, but this is their Titicaca, and it is... 100% uh, alpaca and it's a lace weight. So I held those two strands of the super soft and one strand of the titicaca in order to create this fabric here. This here. And I am so pleased with it. It's really kind of come across as a beautiful golden shade. At one point I wondered if it was more sort of an olive green, but I think that's one of the, the, the magical properties. <laughs> of this colour and um, is that in some lights it looks gold and in others it looks green so I'm really pleased with how that worked up and then of course I had to decide what colour my stripes were going to be. Now in the pattern for this striped version, these broader stripes, uh, Rebecca had recommended that you chose, what was it, one, two, three, four contrast colours and your main colour so obviously I already knew what my main colour was going to be. It was going to be this gorgeous gold. And then I decided that I thought my best course of action was to choose some of my JC Rennie mini balls, which are from Wee County Yarns. Now, I was very fortunate to be gifted a beautiful big box of these from my grandma this Christmas. And I had some from before as well, which were also a lovely gift. And so um, basically I went through my mini ball collection. As you can see, I could probably, probably do another one. <laughs> and I started pairing them up. So I started, in fact, let me see where are, no, that's not it. Oh no, I can't find them. Yes, I started to pair up some of these colourways together and I'll just, you know, for demonstration purpose, like I could hold these two together and then I would start adding in a lace weight in order to get the gauge. So it would take two of the mini balls and one of the lace weights. And I really experimented quite a lot, which is why some of these, um, I'm like, I used these ones with this turquoise and I had a strand of turquoise lace weight to hold with that. 
and I just moved through from dark to light, or actually I was doing this the other way around, light down to dark, and the same on this other sleeve here. And then I did the same with these two sides, the purple and the red and the pink. So I had a, an enormous amount of fun playing with these colours, creating these kind of colour gradients and putting together these shades. I had, think I had mentioned that I went to a creativity and entrepreneurship course workshop that had been run by Bernard Klein in Glasgow uh, back in June. Goodness me, feels like a lifetime ago, but no, <laughs> it was back in June. I had already been to one of his exhibitions, on an exhibition of his work, and I'd really felt very excited about his custom tweeds that he had done for some of the big fashion houses in Paris, including Chanel, Givenchy and Dior. And so I had bought the book that went along with the exhibition, which I think you can now purchase from the website, and I will include the link to the website. but. Uh, I loved the I loved the book because it gave me kind of these fragments of patterns and fabrics and colors and so you can see I hope you can see that <laughs> I have been rather influenced by Bernard Klein's use of colors now I'm just going to see if I can find some more here you go maybe that kind of gives you an idea of this one here uh, let me find some more because they are really spectacular. I just love the way in which he puts these colours together and they're tonally quite similar um, and maybe they're only just a couple of shades apart from one another um, but that makes all the difference I think. If you look at the colours in this one here you've got the pink and the purple, you've got the green and then you've got this gold and I think that was really also an influence in my my colour choices. And I should say actually that none of this was conscious. So I didn't pick out this book and go, okay, now I'm going to put these now I'm going to put these colours together in a cardigan. Uh, rather I went to the exhibition, I participated in the workshop, I became familiar with his work and his colour aesthetic. Look at this. And, uh, and that has kind of, I suppose, subliminally influenced me in my, in my own personal colours and how I was picking them for this project. So now that I look at the book afterwards, I'm noticing all the different ways in which I have been influenced by this beautiful, by his beautiful work, really, and his colour aesthetic. So I just wanted to share that with you because I think that's really fun. I think it shows us the ways in which, you know, when we expose ourselves to, to beauty, to art, uh, we are then, we then start to find different ways in which that filters through into our making and into our imagining. And I think this cardigan really kind of represents, represents that. So I think Bernard Klein was maybe my, my inner teacher <laughs> when it came to, to doing this particular, this particular knit. And of course, the other thing I had to learn for this project was in fact intarsia because I had never done intarsia before and I had kind of built it up in my head as though it was going to be something terribly complicated and uh, I was going to have to, you know, properly sit down and go over it and be serious about it, maybe do a class. <laughs> and instead, actually, I discovered that, I mean, this is simple intarsia and I know you can get a lot more complex, but... <clears throat> But yes, uh, this is this I, I opened up the, the doors of possibility for me. So I'm going to show you the inside of this cardigan so that you can see it better. And you can see the intarsia seam. Now, basically, all that I was doing was uh, putting the, the old yarn over the top of the new yarn and then beginning to knit with the new. And what you what that did was it kind of created this this seam here, and I just made sure that I was kind of tugging a little bit on my yarn for those first couple of stitches, not like yanking it, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that my tension remained as even as possible across that across that seam, and I think I did, I think I did okay. 
I'm quite pleased with how it's worked out. And obviously the further up the the further up the cardigan you get, the more accomplished it becomes. <laughs> but uh but yes, I am pleased with how that's worked out. Um I think I did I think I did a good job. <laughs> The other thing I did was I sewed in my ends as I went because obviously I have three strands for every loose end and uh, that was all going to become a terrible muddle if I continued to to leave them loose so I just sewed them in as I went and I'm really glad I did that because otherwise there would have been quite a lot of loose ends and it would have been a big job at the end of the cardigan. Um, so it's a bit of a reminder for me that, you know, when I when I take that time to, you know, to weave the ends in as I go, then, um, you know, I'm really creating some more space at the other end of, of the project. This is the inside of the sleeves here. And again, of course, you're not doing intarsia on the sleeves. You're only doing intarsia on the back of the on the back of the body. But there you go. That's where my ends are all woven in there. I really struggled with this sleeve. I knitted this sleeve, I think, well, part of this sleeve, certainly about three times because I kept casting on with the color and then deciding I didn't like the color or the color didn't work with the rest of the cardigan. And, you know, I love what I've chosen. I'm really pleased with it now, although part of me is still going. It's a little bit too close to the, to the purple in the body when this side is so, you know, dynamically contrasting with its sleeve, but uh, it is what it is what it is now. I'm not I'm not redoing the sleeve again. <laughs> and actually, after I chose the colours and I started to knit with it, I saw the most beautiful uh, hydrangea plant that had exactly these colours growing in one of my neighbours' gardens. So I'll pop a wee photograph up of that so you can see it too but it was just absolutely glorious. So there we go. And the other, the next big project, the next big part of this project was the button band because the button band is knitted separately. It's a double knitted button band, uh, which you then wash and block separately from the, from the cardigan, which is also washed and blocked. And then you sew on the button band using mattress stitch. So this is my mattress stitch seam down here. You can see I quite, I actually quite like doing mattress stitch. I know a lot of people don't like doing seaming. Um, I learned how to knit a long time ago. And at that point, seam pieced garments were the only, the only patterns available. Um, I wasn't knitting in the round at all at that point. Everything was knitted. Um, in individual parts and pieces and then it was all seamed together. So seaming for me is, is actually a very straightforward and just piece and it's just part of the process. Uh, so I really actually quite enjoyed taking the time to mattress seam my button band onto the body and I used, instead of using the same combination of yarn that I've been using for that, I decided just to use my lace weight alpaca so I didn't add extra bulk to the seam because really that seam is going to be running you know and lying across your neck and down your front and so I didn't want to be adding any more additional bulk onto the onto the mattress seam. So that's what I did and then I, I sewed it all up together. Uh, Rebecca had a wonderful suggestion which was you know to knit the button band and then wash and block it well before washing and blocking it uh, measuring it out, you know, so you've got an, uh, so you do have enough uh, length, and then putting your stitches on hold instead of casting them off, and then washing and blocking it. And I did that, and I used. Let me see. Looking in my bag of tricks here. This is a lovely little project bag that my auntie, who makes the cocoon tree bags, gifted to me. Uh, there's her logo. She is going to be at Northeast Wool Fest this weekend. Um, her bags are her, she, her bags are going to be at the Scottish Yarn Festival. She's not going to be able to make it this time, but her bags will be there. 
and she will also be at Yarndale in Skipton. So there's going to be, and she's got an Etsy shop as well. So if you can't get along to any of those festivals, you can still treat yourself to a cocoon tree bag. But that's my little notions purse. And this is what I was trying to fish out of it. It is a nappy pin. <laughs> now, my youngest child is turning 22 this year. <laughs> so it's been a long time since I actually had to use a nappy pin. In fact, do we even really use nappy pins anymore? I, well, maybe people do. Certainly when I was um, in, in the, the way of changing nappies on a very regular basis, I had three children under the age of four. <laughs> and at one point, now under the age of three, and at one point, all of them were in nappies. So that was, that was full on. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I think we did have some nappy pins and some... Uh, some like cloth nappies, but most of them were the disposable. But I, I think maybe with um, environmental concerns, maybe we're going back to these. But anyway, a nappy pin is actually a very handy thing to have in your Notions purse because I just popped my stitches from my button band onto the nappy pin and then I washed and blocked it. And then I discovered that my button band was far too long <laughs> because of course it blocked, blocked a bit longer. And actually Rebecca does say in the pattern uh, to wash and block a swatch for your button band. And I did not do that. <laughs> I did not take that suggestion. But as it was, I had knitted mine a little bit too long. And so I just ripped back a few rows and then I, I finished it off, I cast it off in pattern. So, last of all, buttons. <laughs> now, these buttons are amazing. I had seen these buttons online. I think, I think actually it was Rebecca that had recommended them a while back when I was looking for buttons for the Corin cardigan, which is another one of her designs. And uh, I had already bought my buttons from Textile Garden, which I absolutely love and highly recommend. Wonderful service really quick delivery and a really beautiful broad selection of buttons so textile garden is a wonderful place to go and get your get your buttons but this is a different company this is pigeon wishes as you can see i've used four <laughs> these are kind of like like psychedelic almost aren't they they're fabulous i really like them and uh my local yarn shop ginger twist has started to stock pigeon wishes buttons so she had, uh, Jess had those and she had some Barbie core ones and I couldn't decide between them and so I bought both. But then it was when I got home that I realised actually that these multicoloured buttons were actually perfect for my multicoloured cardigan. So I am, like I said, absolutely thrilled with this cardigan. I love the shape of it. I love the fit of it. I love the colours, I love the feel of the yarn, um, I love the finishing on it, the double knit button band. Uh, I know that some people might find double knit button band just like a double knit uh, cord like the one I did in the Spark cardigan to be a bit onerous but actually when you knit it at the very end and you've had the experience of you know having the weight of a whole garment on your needles to then go to the very lightweight of just the button band is actually very good for your hands. I think it's good hand health to move from like a heavier weight project to a lighter weight project, a project that uses larger needles, smaller needles, etc. So moving from the heavy of the of the garment to just the the, the 14 stitches of your of your button band, I think worked really, really well and felt you know, felt enjoyable and actually you got into a rhythm with it and it felt quite easy and straightforward. So, uh, so yes, and the descriptions for how to do the buttonholes was very clearly articulated, easy to follow. I quite often struggle with the placement of my buttonholes, um, uh, but this time I think I did pretty well. So again, I will scoot up. <laughs> there we go and show you how it fits. So it's got a little bit of positive ease here. And here's the beautiful buttons and the button band. 
and again it probably comes to just below my natural waist so maybe slightly longer than the cropped fit of the thonin but uh, but yes I, and I've seemed to have got a little bit of a line down here from the blocking mat but I think that I could steam that out but I haven't so far and to be honest I probably would <laughs> just work its way out eventually <laughs> but I'm so so pleased with this I didn't think I was going to get any wear out of it at all until the weather got a little bit colder but actually it has been a little bit cooler and I think I've worn it every day since I got it off the blocking mat and it is the kind of project that just makes you smile just makes me happy it has all my favorite colors in it it's in some of my most favorite yarn it's fit, it fits beautifully, I love the buttons and you know it's been designed by my friend Rebecca and there's something lovely about wearing something that has been designed and dreamt up by a friend. So there we go, this is the Leith cardigan. I have, I should say too, this has been a test knit, I've test knitted this. Uh, the pattern will come out at the beginning, I think at the beginning, certainly it's coming out in September. So really not very long again to wait for this pattern and uh, I yeah, I recommend that you jump right on it as soon as it comes out because uh, it, it is such a fun knit. I, I basically knitted this whole jumper in two weeks, this whole cardigan. So, you know, I, I, look, I found it so compelling uh, that I really struggled to put it down. Part of that, of course, was, um, you know, enjoying the, the blend of the and the moral of the yarns and seeing how that was playing out in the in the construction of the fabric and um, but the pattern itself is also very addictive so I think you will really enjoy knitting it and I think you will end up with a really beautiful piece. There has been somebody I think in the test knit who has knitted a completely plain version of this without any of the stripes at all without the intarsia and I, I was a little bit skeptical about that until I saw it and then I was like Oh no, okay, <laughs> I get it now. Because I think it would be really, because the shape of it is lovely um, and the finishing on it is lovely. So I think it would work absolutely as a cardigan ju just without the without the striping and without the those additional design elements. Uh, but there are really so many options. There's been somebody else in the, in the test knit group, uh, Kelly, who has knitted hers using two different textures but both the same colour so I think they're both ivory and one is drops alpaca and the other is drops alpaca boucle and the contrast of the texture but in the same colour has worked really beautifully too it looks very classy in fact I think Rebecca has bought some yarn to cast that one on as well as a second sample so that was very beautiful too uh, and it's been so fun being part of the test knit group and seeing so many different uh, imaginings of the pattern and people really bringing their own personal colour sense to the design. That's been hugely entertaining and very inspiring. So uh, just so much beauty and uh, just, yeah, really lovely. So there we go. That is my finished object of the week. It is the Leith Cardigan by Rebecca Clo. Which brings me to what I'm working on. So while I was finishing this off, I became completely compelled to have a go at a different kind of project. So, <laughs> so basically I've cast on a shawl and it's not, and I suppose, well, I don't suppose, it is my own design because I knew what I wanted to do with it and I'm just doing it. I'm writing it up as I go and uh, I don't know whether it's going to come out as a pattern because I don't know if anybody else would want to knit this. Uh, <laughs> but really, you know, it's part of my own personal creative practice. I just felt really compelled that this is, the, this is what I wanted to knit and this is, the, this is the design element that I wanted to play with. So before I show you the design itself. I will show you my yarn. It is this BC Garn Jeans Reborn and so this is a uh, recycled denim. I can actually I think fish out just about the uh, tag from the center of the ball. There it is. 
Oh no, it's not BC Garn. It is Kremke. It is Kremke Soul Wool. Reborn Jeans. There you go. It's telling Porky Pies. <laughs> it says, uh, your contribution to slow fashion. This hand knitting yarn has been made with the utmost care and love from 100% post garment recycled textiles. The yarn has been made to be kind to the environment by diverting old clothes that were destined to landfill without the use of any dyes or harmful chemicals and very little water. So I have four skeins of this. Again, it's listed as a worsted weight. Uh, it's a 100 gram skein. And the meterage, however, is 300 meters, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 300 meters. So worsted weight, 300 meters. Uh, so it's, it is light, you know, I mean, I suppose it's all cotton, um, pretty much, isn't it? Like 100% cotton, I think. Oh no, here it is. It says 70% cotton, 25% polyester, which I think is, and 5% other fibers. I think the polyester is from recycled bottles. So anyway, and that's really to kind of bind the fabric. Otherwise, you know, all of these individual fibers wouldn't be sticking together. But here you go, this is it. I realize I'm showing it to you without, without telling you anything more about it. This is a triangular shawl. And you can see this beautiful drape that this, um, this yarn is creating. I knew I wanted some I knew I wanted it to be garter, and I knew that I wanted it to have kind of inset eyelets. So that's so you've got the garter bumps on either side of the eyelet there. And then, of course, we come to the main event. <laughs> and this is a reason why I think people won't necessarily want to knit this. Uh, and maybe it is just part of my own personal practice, in which case it's fine. But we have this row here of bobbles followed by this row of loop stitch. Now, I have I have a particular technique for making bobbles, uh, which doesn't use a crochet hook and it doesn't involve moving your yarn, moving your work from back to front. And I think it's because I have this particular technique that makes this kind of project possible because I think otherwise, uh, if you were having to turn your work for every single bobble, then that would probably be a very twisty turny project. <laughs> and then this stitch here, this loop stitch, I was inspired by um, Lerka Bagger's book. I've got it up there, close knit. Uh, and in it, she has a whole garment that is made with loop stitch. But the instructions for how to create that stitch means you just create one loop per stitch. So I adapted that, that stitch, that technique, to create three loops. If you can see, three loops from each stitch to create a little bit more, a little bit more volume. So that's what it's looking like just now. I've just added in an extra. Uh, row of eyelets there. Uh, the shaping of it is six rows, six stitches to every two rows. So the idea is, is that you're going to be increasing more stitches on either side than you are down the center. So that's going to create like a shallow triangle with longer tips because in my experience of many years of shawl wearing, <laughs> That um, having those longer tips makes it something that's easier to wrap around. It makes it more wearable. Whereas if we are creating the same depth to width ratio, then um, then you end up with much shorter edges. You don't have as much to wrap around you, and yet you have the bulk of the of the depth of it. Uh, so instead of going down that route, I've decided to go for this this shallow triangle because I think that's going to be much easier. To wear and of course because it is a garter stitch uh, project a garter stitch shawl you know if it even if it did flip over to the other side it wouldn't make a huge amount of difference you would just lose this rather dramatic <laughs> this rather dramatic feature so i'm really intrigued to see how this blocks out i want to see what happens to these 
loops and bobbles after they've had a bit of a soak and when all of the garter and the eyelets are, are pinned out, um, I think it will look really beautiful. So I am just working away on this. I'm going to be adding extra sections to it. I am really kind of engaging with my astrology a lot more. Now, I use a lot of astrology in my work, if you don't know what my work is. Uh, I am a goddess guide, which means I support people through the use of goddess archetypes. And I do a lot of work with goddess asteroids in astrological charts. So this going to the Astrological Summer School this year um, is really about kind of deepening into my own personal practice and learning some new things and finding some new teachers. But it has really kind of reignited my desire to bring my astrology practice to my knitting practice. So I've been thinking a lot more about, well, what was the date that I cast this particular project on? And I'm making notes as I'm moving through it about, you know, different um, challenges that I'm finding or different features that I'm discovering in the process of knitting this particular piece. And then I'm applying that to uh, the current uh, transits within the astrological chart. Uh, and one of the thing, one of the big features of an astrological chart right now is the amount of planets that are retrograde. So you might have heard about Mercury retrograde. Uh, it's quite off. I think that's probably the most popular and the most well known because it's what tends to get the blame for missed flights and tech that goes awry. <laughs> it's a lot more complex than that, but um, but really, uh, retrograde is it's an illusion. Yeah, it's uh, due to our perspective on Earth, looking up at the heavens you basically see this planet stop in the sky and then track backwards and then stop and then move forwards again. And it's actually because of the different orbits and our relationship to those to those different planets and, they, and our orbit and their orbit. So it basically looks like it's stopping and going backwards. It obviously, it is not. But we can use that as a way of engaging and bringing that planet and, and its themes more into our awareness. So like I said, we've got this like stops and going backwards, stopping, moving forward. So we're actually crossing over the same part of a chart three times. And I was really kind of connecting that to the creation of the bobbles. Now, as I said, I create my bobbles quite differently uh, than I've seen in other places. Uh, so I am uh, knitting back and forth, uh, back and front. Uh, knitting into the front and back of a stitch four times and then I'm knitting those stitches and then I'm knitting those stitches backwards and so uh, there are, are some really good YouTube tutorials and I'll see if I can find them to show you how to knit backwards without having to turn your work but it is if you are doing bobbles it is revolutionary <laughs> So there's this going back and forth um, that I'm doing in my knitting that's being reflected in these transits, in these um, uh, retrogrades right now. We've got our Venus retrograde. We're in the shadow of the next Mercury retrograde, but we also have, gosh, I think it's Neptune, Pluto and Saturn are all in retrograde right now. So it's retrograde season, really. And so that's what I'm calling this shawl. And um, this is my retrograde season shawl. The other way in which that that back and forth or is really being or that retrograde is really being symbolized, I think, is in these three loops coming from one stitch for crossing over the one area three times. I think that's also being represented in this in this stitch design, too. So. I'm excited to see how this develops and um, how it ends up looking. I'm finding it very, again, very compelling. I'm not really wanting to put it down very much, <laughs> uh, but I am obviously. But uh, but yes, I do. I'm finding a lot of um, joy is, is being sparked with this particular project. So uh, so that is currently my only whip. It's the only thing I'm working on right now because I worked solidly on this and now I'm working solidly on that. Do tend to find that though that I go through phases of you know casting on lots of projects and then having lots on the go and then being very monogamous uh, in my knitting and, and really kind of drilling down in one particular project and getting very granular and very um, intently focused on it and moving it all the way through to completion 
and I get a lot of um, I get a lot of satisfaction from that uh, casting on a project and following it the whole way through without the dilution of other projects coming in. Uh, and I certainly found that with this project and I am finding it with this project too. That said, I do have upcoming plans. So I will share those with you now. <laughs> One of my upcoming plans is that I will be casting on a shrug as part of our Scottish Shrug Club Cal. Now, I am going to be knitting this for my son's girlfriend, Sonia, and it is her birthday coming up at the end of this month. And uh, I'm going to show you the, I'll show you the yarn and I'll talk to you a little bit about the project. This is the yarn. It's called Rowan Romance. And uh, I don't have any more information. I don't have any colourway or anything for it, but I can tell you that it's 36% acrylic, 27% nylon, 26% mohair, 8% uh, polyester and 3% wool. There <laughs> you go. Now, this is deep, 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 deep stash. <laughs> oh, I should also say it's 50 grams and I think it's 55 meters per 50 grams. So this is like thick, chunky, fluffy, sparkly yarn. Uh, and it's been in my stash for a very, very, very long time. I think we are actually talking perhaps decades. So the reason why I'm knitting this for Sonia and uh, the reason why it's coming from Deep Stash is because this past weekend, Sonia very kindly offered to come over I don't think she quite knew what she was letting herself in for, but uh, she very kindly volunteered <laughs> to come and help me sort out my stash. Now, I have had requests actually on this podcast before people asking me to share my stash with them and I've had a little bit of embarrassment around it because it was such a mess. And the reason it was such a mess, it was pretty ordered before in our previous property but I used a lot of the yarn to pack my boxes. So, you know, when you get like a large box and if you packed it all full of books, then nobody would be able to pick it up. So instead you pack some books and then you pad it out. You pad it out with a uh, linen or you pad it out with a pillow or a cushion or whatever it is. I did that, but I also used my yarn collection to pad out some of these boxes which meant then that my stash was distributed <laughs> across a number of boxes and they were no longer ordered. And then of course, when we moved in, the emphasis was trying to get everything unpacked. Uh, we would sort through things properly later. Fast forward two years, which it has been since we moved into our new place. I'm still calling our new place. It's not really a new place if you've lived there two years, is it? But anyway. <laughs> our current property <laughs> and uh, I still had not ordered my yarn. It was still an absolute mess. In fact, it was even worse than it was when we first moved in because of course I have rummaged through it so many times as I've tried to find yarn and you know, sometimes been successful, sometimes not. Um, I have bought new yarn and that has then been added to the stash but not in Again, not in any particular order. And so Sonia volunteered to help me sort the stash. So I have two large Calax, not large, but they're, they're Calax units from, from Ikea. So each Calax unit uh, fits four boxes. So I have eight boxes all together. And along the top of that, um, I have my cones. So the cones sit on top of the Calax. And we brought all of the boxes through and we went through them all and we divided them according to yarn weight. And we put all of the DK and chunkier weight yarns through in the other room on my bed. And in here, we put all of the lace weights and all of the fingering weight. And we took it all out of the boxes at which point 
I, I will admit I felt a tinge of despair and I just wanted to shove them all back in the boxes and put them all back in the all back in the calyx again. <laughs> I couldn't abide the thought of actually, you know, having to go through it all because it felt so overwhelming. And uh, so, yes, that that was certainly a feeling. However, Sonia was very helpful and she really stayed very grounded with the whole process and she made it a lot of fun and uh, she didn't make me feel embarrassed about the amount, uh, not even once. <laughs> and, uh, and we went through my yarn and we created boxes that have sweater quantities and there's not very many of those, but there are some. Uh, we went through and put together a, a selection of yarns that are good for shawls. So I've got some shawl yarn options. We have a whole box full of fluffy yarns. So all of my mohairs and all of my Suri alpacas. And with that box in particular, uh, we put all of the balls of mohair on the floor and we sorted them into colorway as well. So now I have a real sense of what my color options are. And this feels really important for me because just like with this um, with this particular garment, I really love to play with my yarn. I really love to pull together different textures and different colors. Uh, that often plays through my choices for shawls in particular, but it does also, as you can see, present in my in my garments as well. So having having all of that available to me as a palette to play with, is a very vital part of my own creative practice. So, so yes, we went through all of that and we sorted it all. And then we went through all of the DK weight yarn, which was on the bed, of which there was so much more than I thought, because I don't tend, to, I keep saying this, I don't tend to knit a lot with DK weight yarn. Um, I'm much more likely to work with a four ply yarn, uh, just because I, I enjoy the weight of that and I enjoy the look of it and the, the heft and drape of the fabric, that, that's my preference. But uh, it did turn out that actually I had quite a lot of DK weight yarn. So I, uh, so that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, some of that, in fact, quite a bit of it was from my grand's stash, which I have inherited. So uh, so yes, I've, I've got that available, but I, you know, again, I don't know, it doesn't have labels on it other than a little tag that says 49p. <laughs> so I don't know what the composition of that yarn is or that, and I, and I could do the flame test, but I haven't done that. Um, because if you if you burn a little piece of your yarn, then you can you can figure out whether it's got natural fiber or if it is, um, or if it's plastic, if it's got acrylic. Uh, but I haven't done that yet. Um, but I will do that at some point when I'm working with it. So yeah, I did have a lot more DK than I expected, but we managed to get through it all and I am so much happier. Every time I open the cupboard now and I see the, the neatly stored yarn, uh, it really brings joy to me. And the other thing we did, of course, was we put all of my yarn into um, IKEA freezer bags because uh, that's how I store the yarn that I'm not using inside the inside the boxes in the calyx and that's really to protect it from from any insects that might want to have a little chomp on my yarn because they love it as much as I do. <laughs> Only thing is I paid for it and it is mine <laughs> so they're not getting to chomp it. <laughs> in our last property we did have a bit of an issue with moths and um, we haven't had that issue in this property uh, so I am, it's really out of an abundance of caution, really. I just want to make sure that my yarn is protected uh, because it's very sad when, when you find that, uh, that it's not protected and that something's had a go at it. So, so anyway, there we go. That was the, the big stash cleanup. And in the process of that, we discovered this. <laughs> and Sonia just fell in love with this yarn. And I think if I hold it back, you'll see that it's it's a very pale blue. It's like an ice blue, and then it's got this um, sparkle through it, which almost like glows green, like a greeny blue. And that's not really being picked up terribly well in the in the, on the camera. Uh, but I have oh I had said to her if she wanted I would see about knitting her a 
like a Kingston or, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the other one, the other design by Tarlyn Morrison, who's Good Night Day. She does a lot of jumper patterns for chunky weight yarn. And I have a couple of those patterns. So I had offered to knit one of those for Sonia, but actually when I looked at what I had, and at my meterage for them, I discovered that I wasn't going to be able to knit her a whole jumper, but I can knit her a Sunday shrug. And the Sunday shrug is the thicker weight version or the heavier weight version of the shrug designs by Jackie. And so I'm going to knit that as part of the Scottish Shrug Club Cal, and I'm going to give it to Sonia for her birthday, uh, which is, like I said, a little bit later on this month. Uh, partly as a thank you and as a nod to all her all her hard work this past weekend. <laughs> so that's my big sort of well that's that's one of my main next projects. The other thing that we uncovered when I was uh, pulling everything out was a couple of projects which are as yet unfinished. Some of them I frogged uh, because I don't intend to complete them and some of those are very old projects. Uh, but one of those projects was my Junko Okamoto plum and it only has the sleeves left to do so I am going to get on with that and knit the sleeves. I'll pop a wee photograph in because I've left it through in the other room. <laughs> so there we go, I'm going to be working on the, the Junko Okamoto uh, plum and like I said all I've got to do is the sleeves. It's knitted using uh, cowgirl blues and it's in their sport weight merino and it's called under pressure is the speckle and then I've used uh, a stripe in fact do you know what I'm just going to go get it give me a second back again that's the great thing about having cleared out that cupboard is I can find everything really quick so <laughs> so that took no time at all uh, this is my plum by Junko Okamoto. Isn't it completely fabulous? I love it, love it, love it so much. Now, my mum actually gave me this yarn, I think possibly the first time we met up again after, lock after the first couple of lockdowns and she managed to come over from France and she brought me this beautiful yarn, which is stocked by Stephanie at My Little Mai, which is the local yarn shop in Cognac, France. And the dyer of uh, uh, the dye company Cowgirl Blues is actually based in South Africa. So it's a very international, very international project. And the fluffy yarn here, you can see this, can you see the fluff? Oh, hang on a second, I can actually show you the fluff even better. Here's the fluff. This is from Fonte. It's Fonte Ombel and it is a wool mohair and it's quite thick. I think it's a DK weight, but I'm not sure. And I have used also this here, which is Pin Up Sport from uh, Ginger Twist in the colorway Au Naturale. And it's the same, it's the same twist, merino twist uh, base, I think, or at least very similar to this one, this under pressure. Can you, you can see this is, this is when my ball winder wasn't working. And so I had to wind all my balls by hand. And if you know anything about my ball winding is, is that I can't wind a spherical ball. They all end up this Easter egg shape. <laughs> why but that's just how they work <laughs> so uh, so yes the original pattern just has the one background color and then your color work I did not quite have enough of this speckled yarn so I knew I was going to have to choose uh, another color to sit behind my color work and so I decided to just get the Au Naturale because it references the um, the Au Naturale color way in the in the speckle and then I thought for my color work that I was gonna use this color here, this yarn here, which is alpaca silk from Hobby. And I had used this to knit my pink fizz. 
and this was a this was a gift from Hobby uh, for review and it's 70% alpaca 30% mulberry silk and it is 166 meters per 50 grams so it is kind of more of a sport weight um so I was going to use that for my for my color work but actually because I was working with merino and then this alpaca silk as the contrast color the two the the, the two yarns did not bond you know they didn't sit nicely together in color work they kind of sat apart they weren't blending and of course that makes total sense because the kind of yarn that I was working with it they are they're a bit slippier you know they're not they're not this kind of sticky rustic yarn it's more it's like a, a smoother yarn so then I had to change up what I was going to use as my contrast color and that's why I went for this fuzzy mohair because I thought that would really kind of bridge the gap between the slippier uh, more merino yarn and uh, and this color work here so you can see it's got a little bit of lace and a little bit of um like cable work there and that follows through down through the body which you can't really see very well on the screen there we go so that falls down through the body and it goes all the way down the inside of the sleeve as well. So that's my next, that's the next thing I want to do because it's so close to being finished. It really would not take me that long to knit these two sleeves and it would be a really wonderful project to have uh, for going into this autumn. And I was also thinking I would really like to bring it with me to Rhinebeck as well. So. Uh, so yes, I have, a, I have a good incentive to get that done and off the needles. But that's both of my projects that are coming up anyway. As for what's new, well, my mailbox was quite busy in a beautiful, delightful way. So the design, the shawl designer, uh, Barbel Salad, uh, got in touch with me and asked if she could send me a copy of Knit Artistic Shawls. 15 special colour work shawl designs and um, this has just been translated into English. I think it's coming out in September so again I think you're going to have to wait just just a few weeks not very long um, but this is the book and I had seen these designs on Instagram and just absolutely swooned over them because they are honestly mind-blowingly beautiful. Look at this, rise like a phoenix. So these are gorgeous colour work shawls. Play of the seasons. I mean, aren't these just, I am, I am absolutely going to be casting one of these on, or more, this gondawa, gondwana. Uh, because I just think they are so, so lovely. And she has samples in like different colorways, so you can see the difference the color the color really makes. Um, this one's called tracery. Uh, they are just beyond the beyond arabesque. They're just I, I'm just so in awe of them, truly. Fan flowers. And at the beginning of the book, she writes about she writes about um, some of the techniques that you need in order to make these shawls. And I was really intrigued in that because obviously when you're knitting colour work, uh, quite often people prefer to knit colour work in the round rather than in the flat. And so she takes that into account. So you're actually doing some steaking with these shawls, which means that you're going to knit in the round and then you're going to cut your knitting. And then you're going to add a border onto it afterwards. Uh, so I think that's a really, I've never done that for a shawl, so I'm quite intrigued. But the other thing that she writes about um, in the introduction, which I will just show you from back here, um, is how to prepare a magic ball. And so you can start to create like your own 
colour changing yarn um, by creating these magic balls. Now I already showed you my big collection of, um, a beautiful big collection of mini balls. Uh, but I also have, you know, cones and I've got my leftovers. And as I was saying, you know, having gone through this big stash cleanup and, and ordering, I now have a bit of a better sense of what I have. So I'm really intrigued to play with this idea of the magic ball and to apply it to these gorgeous, glorious color work shawls. I'll just show you a few more because they are, like I said, just completely stunning. So I'm so excited to have a go at these. I'm thinking this is going to make a really beautiful winter project. I can just really imagine myself getting very comfortable in my in my sofa with all my colours and my colour work, uh, my colour work shawls. Just beautiful and really, like I said, just really eye-catching. Oh, I'm back to Rise Like a Phoenix. I do love that one. <laughs> so yes, uh, just a really special publication. Such an achievement because there's a power of work that's gone into even just the making of these, um, let alone, you know, the putting together of the pattern in the book. I have a, you know, a complete respect for, um, for all the work that's gone into creating this and what a gift of her creativity, of Barbell's creativity she's offered us um, and I will for one absolutely be taking advantage of that and, uh, and knitting myself some beautiful artistic shawls. So that was one of the things that arrived in the post. Another thing that arrived in the post and this arrived in the post a little while back and I kept forgetting to share it with you and so now I, this is me finally remembering to share it with you. Uh, it's this beautiful poster. It's called The Knitter. Can you see her? She's like a, it's a tarot card. But she's the knitter. And it's so lovely. It was a beautiful gift from one of my, one of my lovely viewers, Christy. Uh, thank you, Christy. And uh, I will be popping that into a frame and putting up on the wall in this room just as soon as we get round to painting it. And I know I keep talking about painting the walls in this room. It will happen eventually. Uh, I just have to work up to it because we have to take all these books down and move the bookcases and it's a whole production and I just keep putting it off. Uh, but eventually we will finally paint the walls here. And when we do that, um, I will be uh, I'll be putting this beautiful poster up uh, on the wall. So I got that in the post. And then the uh, yes, just yesterday, actually, I got another package in the post. And this is from Kate of Blue Dot Yarns. And she's going to be vending at the Scottish Yarn Festival. I first met Kate a couple of years ago and I bought from her some yarn. I think I gave it as a, I think I gave some as a giveaway here. And it was in the colorway Moon Age Daydream because it had been inspired by David Bowie. So she's going to be back at the Scottish Yarn Festival this year and she's got another colourway which is influenced by David Bowie and it's and she has sent me a skein. I'm so pleased. It's just fantastic. So this is 100% superwash merino, 400 metres to 100 grams and it's called Magic Dance. Look at those speckles! Look and look how delicate and those, these colours are and then the kind of boldness of the gold. and So Magic Dance, of course, is David Bowie in his labyrinth phase. Possibly my favourite. <laughs> but you can really see the colours in the image there and how well Kate has managed to come up with a, with a colourway that just is completely glorious and it's going to be so much fun to, to work with. I really love these sections too. They're almost opalescent. And then alongside that, very kindly, she's given me these beautiful fluorite stitch markers. Now, I've mentioned Kate's stitch markers on the podcast before because I use them a lot. In fact, I can probably find them in my... Yep, almost immediately because I use them all the time. And I bought these from... Um, 
the Scottish Yarn Festival from Kate a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I use them all the time. And I said to her actually that I'm completely convinced that uh, her beautiful stitch markers imbue my knitting with good energy, some good juju. <laughs> so there we go. That was a lovely gift from Kate. Thank you so much. I'm completely delighted with them. And uh, if you are going to be along at the Scottish Yarn Festival, then you will be able to treat yourself to some. I know she said she's going to have some of these stitch markers there as well, but she will also have other colourways and other stitch markers also. And again, if you're not going to be able to get to the festival, then please check out her Etsy site, uh, her Etsy shop, because she has um, some of her yarn and stitch markers available there. So there we go. That was my that was my new to me. I was very lucky. I'm a very lucky girl. <laughs> and all of that brings me to what's been bringing me joy. Okay, so finished White Lotus. That last episode. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> I think I had said last time that when I started, when I when the point that we had got to, maybe it was like three three episodes in, we were maybe about halfway. That things had begun to unravel and oh my goodness the the unraveling sped up and it was chaotic and um quite something so uh so yes i i felt really um engaged in the storytelling and fascinated by it and repelled by it also and uh i'm still not entirely sure what i think about it so i'm not sure whether i can recommend it or not but uh but we watched it <laughs> We also finished Last of Us, and I can't remember whether I mentioned that we'd finished Last of Us when I spoke to you before, but we finished that. And then after all of that, we felt we needed something a little bit lighter. So we watched The Sewing Bee. So the most recent uh, series of The Sewing Bee on BBC has just wrapped up. I think it started while I was away. And so, or, dis or perhaps maybe not even away, but distracted. <laughs> And so uh, we started watching that from the very beginning of the, of the new season and watched it the whole way through. So, so enjoyed it. If you're not familiar with The Sewing Bee, it's the Great British Sewing Bee. So it's a similar format to The Great British Bake Off, um, which I think in the States is called The Great British Baking Show because I don't think you use the phrase Bake Off. Uh, but it's basically like a baking competition and this is a sewing competition so it's the same principles there's like three different tasks one is they're given a pattern which they've never seen before and they need to to make the the item from that particular pattern the next is kind of like an invention test uh, so they're given something that they have to then work with in order to create in something new so, and that can be something like a shower curtain, try and make a, a piece of evening wear from a shower curtain. Uh, to, uh, in fact, one of the ones this time round was some crochet blankets. So that was quite interesting. And the last one is like the, the big show piece. So the made to measure. So they have models in and they have to make a garment uh, that fits their fits their model and that's really an, an opportunity for them to show their full creativity and really show up and shine and then they have a bit of a catwalk show at the end and then somebody wins garment of the week and somebody gets sent home and it gets whittled down over the weeks each week has like a different theme as well uh, so there's like a there's a children's week there was now I'm, I'm drawing a complete blank I think there was a recycling week like for sustainable fabrics and things like that uh there were other ones as well there was, a, there was a 90s week this time i do remember that uh so yes there's lots of different themes each week that they're following and the the cohort that the and in fact in every year the the cohort always get on so well with one another they're very supportive very loving uh, and very yeah, it's not a, it's not a financial prize. It's won at the end or anything like that. It's, you know, it's that you've just you've won the the competition, and so there's none of that nasty kind of competitiveness. It's um it's all in very good humor and and people are very supportive of one another's creativity and it's um it's just very heartwarming really and really lovely. So we watched Sewing Bee, 
and then that finished and then we noticed that uh, the TV show Shetland was on the BBC and it was all the episodes. Now I've wanted to watch Shetland for quite a long time but the way the BBC iPlayer works is when they show an episode of something they have a time limit on how on the length of time that's going to be available for you to view and so the previous series weren't available only the most recent series and I didn't want to like just jump in at a later series having not watched the earlier ones. However, they have now made all the earlier series available. So we've jumped on that. We are now on season four. Knitwear game is on point, which I expected. Uh, the acting is excellent. It's based on the novels of Anne Cleves. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's very cleverly done. Quite often I am able to pick who done it in a, in a crime drama. Uh, I'm, I've not managed to pick one yet in Shetland, so <laughs> so yes, it's it's been consistently surprising, which is good, and uh, and yes, so we're really enjoying that. My husband is also feeling very inspired and has now planned uh, a whole trip to Shetland, so maybe that will be happening at some point. <laughs> you won't be surprised; it's by train. <laughs> We also, I mentioned at the very top of the episode that we saw Barbie followed by Oppenheimer, which I think is popularly called Barbenheimer now. But um, our original plan had just been to see Barbie and then go out for dinner. So that's what we did. We saw Barbie. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very clever. Um, it was very engaging. Um, it's. I had seen an article headline before I saw the movie and I didn't read the article because I didn't want any spoilers but the headline of the article was um, Barbie is the new Inanna and Inanna is a Sumerian goddess who descends to the underworld to meet her um, to meet her sister who is a queen of the underworld goddess of death um, Erishkagel and she has to pass through all of these tolls in order to to meet her her sister and I won't tell you anymore because it actually maps uh, pretty closely <laughs> onto the um, onto the narrative. So I think having, I've still not read the article, uh, but I might write a piece of my own perspective, obviously working with goddess archetypes in my work. Um, I would quite like to piece that together for myself and to share what it was that I was seeing in that, in, in that comparison. So I thought that was fascinating. Uh, we then went for dinner. Uh, we went to Frankie and Benny's because they had 30% off main meals if you showed a, um, that day cinema ticket, which of course we had. So we had our, we had our dinner. And then we realised that in about 15 minutes time, the final showing of Oppenheimer for that evening was going to be showing. Now Oppenheimer is a three hour movie and we went into the cinema at half past nine uh, and of course the movie had its trailers and its adverts and so it didn't start till 10. So it didn't finish until about one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> that said, I didn't feel sleepy at all. I, quite often I get to about midnight and I'm like, I, I really need to go to my bed now. But uh, I managed to stay up <laughs> and watch the whole thing. And I was absolutely fascinated about it. I think perhaps the most basic description of it which will not sell it whatsoever is it's a lot of men talking in rooms <laughs> but it's actually very interesting <laughs> and it's a lot more political than I expected it to be um I don't know about you but I, I think it's quite a, a quite a common thing that the imagery of um of nuclear warfare and nuclear bombs is very triggering and very uh, I think it triggers a um, a collective trauma and uh, and so I was very reticent about uh, watching it you know when I was growing up and going to school we had quite a lot of information given to us about um, nuclear warfare and fallout and all kinds of things and I think we were exposed to, to the narratives and the um, the horror of it far too early in the school system um, so I really wasn't that keen on going to see Oppenheimer. 
but I'm very glad that I did because actually it didn't focus so much on that. It was really very much a biopic of Oppenheimer himself and uh, and how he moved through, I suppose, the the movement, the, the transition from th sort of something in theory to something that has very practical and real world implications. And again, the full horror and, and tragedy of that. So, so yes, I did really enjoy it. I thought the performances was, were excellent. I thought Killian Murphy was very, very charismatic through it. He, he really carries the movie through. Um, that said, Robert Downey Jr. was an absolute tour de force. So I will be very surprised if they don't have a couple of Oscar nods coming up. So we watched that in the cinema, but we also went to a show because right now it is the Edinburgh Festival and that means the world comes to Edinburgh. <laughs> so generally we are, I think, around about 500,000 population in Edinburgh. We are not a big city. And in the Fringe, uh, in the festival in August, we swell to a population of about 1 1.5, 1.6 million. Uh, so our infrastructure is not really um, cut out, not really designed for that many people. It's, and we struggle with um, accommodation issues throughout that month as well. Uh, it's a very full period, but it's also very culturally rich. And so there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of things going on during the festival and it's all competing for your attention. So there are, there's concerts, there's comedy, there's uh, the book festival, so you've got lots of author events, uh, there's, there's the film festivals coming up as well, which has kind of been revived. Um, there is just, there's the tattoo, I mean it's just constant and full on. As a resident, uh, it can be pretty, um, pretty difficult to just kind of move around your everyday life. I think a lot of people struggle to get to work because of the pressures on the public transport system. Uh, certainly you're not able to go out to your, to the restaurants or anything without booking in advance. Uh, so you just have to be a bit more mindful that, you know, like I said, the world has come to Edinburgh and so we need to, we need to kind of adapt accordingly. And it does also mean that we get to dip in and then dip back out to the outskirts <laughs> and, uh, and enjoy some shows. So we went out to the Voodoo Rooms on Tuesday and we saw an act call of, by a woman called Ivy Page. Ivy Page is a burlesque singer and she was on The Voice and so this is a one woman show uh, she's accompanied by Pete on the piano who I think has contributed to the songwriting and she tells her story about you know her experience of being on The Voice and her experience of being a burlesque dancer and singer and uh, it was really good fun she did. She really, she really kind of held everybody's attention, and she, and it was an hour long. It didn't feel like an hour had passed at all. So before we went to that, we actually had dinner at the Voodoo Rooms, which was delicious. It was really good, and then we had a we had a drink in the bar before we came home uh, on the tram. So it was just again, just like dipping in and then dipping back out again, and I think that's perhaps the way that that. Um, if you're going to do the f the festival while living in Edinburgh, that's probably how you do it. So, <laughs> so there we go. I'm just going to share a couple of things that I've been watching on YouTube. Uh, I was watching a good yarn, uh, which is uh, Carmen and Jackie's podcast. Uh, they are currently doing a fleur along, so to knit a fleur shawl. Uh, their podcasts are are long. Uh, but they're wonderful and they are friendly and they're wonderful company. So if you've not discovered a good yarn yet, I recommend that. Uh, I also started watching a yarn story. Um, a yarn story is a local yarn uh, store down in Bath in England and it's owned by Carmen. And uh, so she's doing this uh, podcast uh, with her friend who I think also works in the shop and uh, they've done the first 10 episodes 
I know they've gone on a, a, a little summer break and they're going to be coming back with season two. So it's actually a really good time now, I think, to go back and, and watch season one. Their most recent episode, which came out maybe just last week, maybe two weeks ago, uh, they were trying on some of the store samples and they are very different sizes. And so they were showing what the store sample looked like on their on them and on their bodies and how... Um, and it was a kind of an exploration of fit and of ease. And they showed you how to measure yourself and it was really, really good. I strongly recommend that you check out that particular episode. Even if you don't watch all of the others in the previous nine, watch the 10th one because it was excellent. And then the other thing I wanted to share with you is that Amy from La Bien Amé has started a series on her YouTube channel called Amy's Knit Lab. And ostensibly, I think it's to share her creative practice, what she's knitting, what she's working on, what new yarns she has coming up um, as part of the La Bien Amé range. But uh, she also this time had the wonderful Nancy Marchand on to tell us all about her most recent publication, Woven. And okay, this is in Tarja plus, plus, plus. But having now tackled the very basic intarsia on the, on the on the Leith cardigan, I am feeling quite inspired and, and a little bit adventurous and audacious. So I am really, really intrigued by uh, what Nancy is doing with, uh, with intarsia. And actually, you might better know Nancy for her work with brioche. Uh, she really kind of made brioche the the sort of technique that we are using right now in our garments and in our accessory designs uh, she really kind of pushed the edges of what was possible with it and i feel like she's doing the same with intarsia right now so a really interesting guest a really lovely connection as well between between them uh, i think you might really enjoy that okay goodness me so that is everything that's been bringing me joy Oh, probably not. There probably are things, but that's all I'm sharing right now. <laughs> but I thought I would share something with you because we started at the top with this card, the Cobra and the inner teacher. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And one of the teachers that I always think is a very important one for me in my life is John O'Donoghue. So I decided I was just going to take Anam Kara, which is one of his um, best known texts, off the shelf and I was going to thumb through the pages and I was going to open it and see where it be, where it, see what happened and, and see where it, um, see where it opened up to and the page that I opened it to was the soul desires expression so I'm just going to read you a little bit from this section the human person deeply desires expression one of the most beautiful ways the soul is present is through thought Thoughts are the forms of the soul's inner swiftness. In a certain sense, there is nothing in the world as swift as a thought. It can fly anywhere and be with anyone. Our feelings too can move swiftly, yet even though they are precious to our own identity, thoughts and feelings still remain largely invisible. In order to feel real, we need to bring that inner invisible world to expression. Every life needs the possibility of expression. When we perform an action, the invisible within us finds a form and comes to expression. Therefore, our work should be the place where the soul can enjoy becoming visible and present. The rich unknown, reserved and precious within us can emerge into visible form. Our nature longs deeply for the possibility of expression, which we call work and which I would say call making, because <laughs> I feel like our making is absolutely an expression of our soul. And on that note, my loves, I'm going to release you all into the rest of your days. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I will return on the other side of Northeast Wool Fest. I will have a wee prize package, I hope, and I will tell you all about that when I get back. And uh, until then, happy making and I will speak to you all really soon.